the last year, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of the divide between people. And neuroscientists like myself were at the center of this divide. And I saw this, and this made me understand how terrible it is. Uh, apparently, <laughs> uh, neuroscientists uh, get a lot of uh, hate from the world. But actually, this is going to drive me to what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> I wanted to talk about connections. But I wanted to try to do it in a different way than a regular TED talk where a person just projects to you from a red circle. I wanted to get you involved in my talk. So I wanted you to help me communicate a complex idea. And for that to happen, we decided we're going to try to do an experiment with the audience. So you can imagine that I'm quite nervous, uh, because it all depends on you. I have only one plan. If everything works out, I did not really <laughs> figure out what I'm going to say if things don't work, don't work out. So this event has to work. So uh, section A, across from me, you're it. Um, we call it the TED experiment, <laughs> a term coined by a colleague of mine, Dan Ariely. And Here's how it's going to go. You all have these styrofoam boards in front of you. They look something like that. And here's what we're going to ask you to do. In a second, I'm going to show on this screen an image. This image reflects a top view of you guys. And I'm going to ask you to generate this image all together with every one node becoming a pixel. So here goes. That's the image. Start. You're getting it? You're getting it? Some of you realize right now that everything is red, and you realize that you need to change it to black. Figuring out your position. So right now, I see a sea of red. <laughs> Do you see yourself from above? Someone needs to figure out that there is a trick here and flip <laughs> the other side. OK. So people start to turn it to the other side, making it black. The guys on the left. I hear your paper conversation. Good, good. Take your time. It's not like there's a clock here uh, running. OK. Someone flipped to black. More people flipping to black. OK. <laughs> people in the front are still at red. OK, more blacks on the side. Yes, we're flipping to more blacks, more blacks. It's getting there, it's getting there. There's still some on the, on the fifth row, still a few extras are red. More red, more, red, more black, sorry, more black. OK, more and more, more. OK. 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 <laughs> All right, step one. <laughs> a clue. Black is white here. <laughs> Let's try another one. Are you ready? OK, this went very fast. Fantastic. Still two people. Uh, looking good. Fantastic. OK, one minute. And now the third one. OK. Fantastic. We're not done yet. <laughs> we remain, went in increasing complication. Now we're going to do the most complicated one. Because up to now, I kind of chose for you the target. What I want to do now is I want to show you three options and have you figure out yourself which ones you, as a collective, want to converge towards. Amazing. Good job. <laughs> OK. I didn't do much. Um, let's talk about it for a second. Let's see what did we learn from this simple experiment. First of all, convergence takes time. As it turns out, even if you all knew what you think you should do, it still takes some time to aggregate information across a big group. Second, systems learn. 
All of you did much better on the second time compared to the first, and even better on the third time, and then the fourth time you just went there right away. Not only did the entire group learn, but also each node, each individual learned something. You learned uh, who you should look at. You learned what you should look at. You learned your place. You maybe learned who is the weakest link in your row and kind of uh, uh, <laughs> talk to them. You also maybe learned how I think. In the beginning, when I just introduced things, you didn't even know what to expect. Would it be a smiley face, a heart? You didn't know what it could be. Now you kind of got a sense of what my thinking is. You also uh, learned something that you can't name, which is that there is some information that's spread across all of you that retains even if you're not there. We didn't try it, but if I took one of you out and replaced with someone else, actually the new person wouldn't start from the beginning. They would somehow learn something with you because the group knows now how to train new people. You learned that having feedback is key to learning. Having you see from above what's going on was really instrumental here. And actually, to supplement that even more, I would say that having constraints really help. Because by me telling you that there are three options, I made it possible for you to converse with something. If I just said infinite options, just come up with an answer, you would never converge. But somehow, having constraints allowed your free will to still come to something, to some agreement. That's kind of the, how the world is. We think about free will as totally free, but the reality is that free will is constrained. When you go to a restaurant, there's a finite set of menus. When you go to Tinder, there's, well, somewhat finite set of menus. We also learned that sometimes not doing anything is the answer. Some of you never had to flip your X, those on the top or bottom from your end, bottom right side. You had just to stay the same. Somehow, not doing anything could also be a signal. And finally, you learn that sometimes meaning emerges from the network. And this is what I wanted to focus on for the next couple of minutes. In the last couple of years, scientists have been trying to understand how consciousness works. Consciousness, one of the hallmarks of neuroscience, has been something that we were not able to study for a while. We didn't have the tools or the understanding of how to approach it. Philosophers, poets, wrote about that for decades, centuries, millennia. But neuroscientists were stuck. We knew how to study intelligence, but we never knew how to study consciousness. The difference between those two is that, well, intelligence is the ability to solve problems and to maybe come up to decisions, and consciousness is the feeling of those. Depicted nicely in this example of a moment where Watson plays a game of Jeopardy against the two leading players of all times. Please There's a moment where Watson wins. Watson, what is executor? Right. Same category, 1600. Answer, very double. And you see his programmers, David Ferrucci, one of my colleagues, that excited about that. It's over. You see Ken Jennings disappointed that he's about to lose. But the question is, what does Watson feel? Does Watson know that it's winning? Does it care? Does it feel pride, accomplishment, happiness? Computers become better and better in emulating intelligence, but they are not advancing at all in being conscious. In fact, when I was thinking of ways to depict that in this talk, I couldn't come up with a good understanding of how a group of nodes somehow creates a conscious mind, until, fortunately, I drove to Naperville and was stuck in traffic on the way here. And when I uh, tried to call and explain why I'm late, I said, I'm actually stuck in traffic, to which I got the answer, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. It's going to come back in a second after I tell you that I spent the last 15 years studying the brain from the inside. You've seen enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working with patients undergoing brain surgery and studying neurons individually, trying to understand how thinking works by looking at individual neurons one at a time, looking at you and you and you and you, and trying to understand how you give rise to memories, to emotions, to decisions. But somehow we could never explain this one sentence. How all of those neurons together give rise to something that is above and beyond what they do as single ones. We were never able to understand how sections of the brain can actually work together to solve a problem without understanding how they interact with other sections. So in this room, there are many sections. And each of you can emulate a part of the brain that does one thing. One of you processes smell, one of you processes images, making decisions, feeling temperature, regulating the heart. And this is key to understanding how consciousness works, because as it turns out, our brain is isolated. And by being isolated, it gives rise to different things. Each part knows about its own function, but doesn't control the other functions. 
which means that we can actually come between and change things. I'm going to demonstrate that in another experiment. On the screen in front of you, you see an image flickering. You're all seeing it. Individual neurons in your brain are now being disturbed. In your brain, there are neurons that fire for things like your mom, your dad, the Eiffel Tower. And one of those neurons right now is turning on and off, on and off, because it knows that there's not just one picture here, but actually two images alternating. There's one thing that keeps changing between those images. Now, don't say it, but just raise your hand if you see this thing. OK, so if you don't see that, now you believe me that there is something there? <laughs> Keep your hands high so your friends will see. And keep raising your hand if you identify it. Now, those of you who didn't see it right now are starting to scan the image from left to right, up to bottom. You're looking at the number of windows on the airplane. You're counting the shadows. Is it the Canada flag? It also correlates with IQ, by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the engine right at the center. The good news is that you can never now unsee it. For the rest of your life, you're always uh, going to see it. But what's interesting for me as a neuroscientist was that if I were to look at your brain, there would be a neuron there that codes engine that would turn on and off, on and off, on and off. It's just that this neuron sits in section C, and it doesn't speak to section A, and somewhere in between there's a gap. And this gap is critical these days. Because as we learn more about how we can manipulate memories, hack into brains, put it devices in the head that speak to the brain from the outside and can be hacked by villains who want to inject thoughts into our mind, or even things like deep fakes that create imagery that is not true, they can leak into your mind because they speak to one part of the brain but not the other, and for the other part of the brain, whatever comes from the first one is real. We're not equipped to live in a world where we can't trust information within our brain, but that's already step one. Step two is even more alarming. Because theories of consciousness right now suggest that there's something even more profound that can be done. Because section C only interacts with section A through some neurons that go between them, there's no way for you to know if information comes from within the brain or from the outside. And for the first time, we have theories on consciousness that suggest that we can actually fuse brains to one another. Now, this is just a theory. It wasn't tested yet. But the theory made predictions that already worked. So this one is the last one. A brain bridge would suggest that you take the brain of Brian, the brain of Alice, two independent brains that have entirely different systems talking to only themselves. And once you create wiring between those brains, you connect some neurons from one to the other, they become one, but not just the sum of two brains, but actually a third entity that comes to life that thinks it's one. Same as your brain right now doesn't really say, oh, I have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. There are two different things that are just sitting in the same place. No, you think of yourself as one. So will Alice and Brian turn into Bobby as soon as you plug their brains. And Bobby will think that it's one single entity. In fact, if a doctor came to Bobby and said, Bobby, we discovered that you have a tumor on your left side and we have to resect it, will you give us permission? He would say, of course. I would want to do anything to save myself. And in resecting his left side, he might actually put an end to what used to be Brian. Just the same as someone can come to you and say, you know, you have a tumor on your left hemisphere, we have to take out part of your brain, and you would say yes to that. So merging two brains can actually kill who you are and become something else that is bigger than you. Now, this is a prediction, but it doesn't end there. We've been looking at connecting brains in all kinds of ways in the last couple of years. My lab has been engaged in studies for the last five years that look at ways to see how brains communicate using external stimuli how odors change your brain. You may have heard about women whose menstrual cycle uh, align when they're in the same place. Now we know that odors control that. You may have heard that uh, people who hold the uh, uh, wife's hand when she's delivering a baby somehow change her feeling of pain. She feels less pain when she holds her husband or boyfriend's hand because touch also communicates. There are now studies that look at mice and showing that circulating blood between one to another actually changes the aging of mice, making a young mouse older and an old mouse younger, which is creepy if you think <laughs> what it could do to the idea of generating mice just for blood. We're looking at ways to have doctors empathize with patients better by seeing how we can connect their brains, looking at students in class and see how we can make them uh, connect to their teachers such that the teacher would be able to actually communicate ideas to the student directly. And even we're looking at dating. 
and trying to see what happens to brains of couples after they spend time together, what changes. And the reality is that things change. Our brains interface all the time. Smells, touch, viewing the same content, being in the same room, all of those things affect our brains. So we don't have to put wires in order to make people alike. We just need to create shared experiences that will make them work towards the same thing. And this, in many ways, is something that we've been looking at for a while. Our world creates divisions all the time. I opened by telling you about ones, and I said I'm studying connection. But right now in this room, there are two groups seeing the world differently. We know what's going on here. We can explain to you the neuroscience and why, why your past experiences actually determine whether you see a dress that's black and blue or gold and white. If you see an X that's white or, and red or black and red. And we understand more and more about how your brains become one. And the reason it's critical is because there's more and more interest in finding ways to connect brains by groups of people whose interests are not fully aligned with ours. The idea in Silicon Valley of connecting brains is really popular because it suggests that if we can connect brains, we can actually download our thoughts, share minds, connect with the universe. It's very spiritual, but behind that lies a fear of death, a fear of what will happen to me when I'm no longer there. So people actually suggest that they're going to do anything to allow their brains to load their thoughts into someone else. So those ideas that seem like science fiction right now are paid for and driven by real people who are eager to see the results of theoretical studies becoming reality. And the reason I want to talk to you and run this experiment is because this is just a one simple way to show how a group together can make a decision. And the decision we have to make right now is not a decision on whether the X should be black or red, but what kind of world we want to be in. A world where everyone can do anything to brains, including changing them, or a world where we decide what is allowed in our brain. Our brain is malleable. Neuroscientists are showing that. People can change our mind all the time. Marketing has been doing it for a while, and now neuroscientists are venturing into the world of changing brains. But before it happens, we can talk about how it will work and have a say and decide in advance. You have only one brain, and it's important that we control it, because at the end, there's one person there. That's you. There's a saying in a book that I really like that summarizes what I think is the message of this, which is the bishop is the most important piece on a chessboard in the eyes of the bishop. <laughs> Thank you so much.